Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles to John 3.16. It's probably a Scripture you're not too familiar with. title of my message this morning is simply called, Love. Love. Amen. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us so much. He loves us beyond anything that can be defined by the greatest poets. He loves us greater than anything that can be measured that any man can do for another man. For God loves man so much, He doesn't want him to perish. And God knows that through His love, men could be rescued from this ultimate destination of eternal death through the gift of His only begotten Son. So the title of this is called Love. Heavenly Father, once again this morning, we are so grateful, Father, for the work that was done on Calvary. Lord, we know the suffering, the pain, the physical aspect was horrible. But Father, that which goes far beyond that which men do not understand, the Lord, the the torment that our Savior went through to provide for us a means to be reconciled unto You was out of a heart of love. He destined Himself, Father, oh yes, from You, the Lord, that He might be able to be that sin offering for us. And it was all out of love. And Father, once again, I pray You anoint Your servant to bring forth this message with understanding by the authority of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that each and every one that hears this message this morning, I pray let them receive it with understanding. And I pray, Lord, that they retain it. And that, Lord, that it may make a change in their lives as only You are able to do. And Satan, I take authority over You by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And once again, Father, we ask that Christ and Christ alone be exalted in His house in the name of Jesus. You know, the English language doesn't lend itself well to making distinctions among the word of love. You know, I don't know about you, but I love coconut pie. Oh, man. I love Pumpkin pie with a big old bunch of whooping cream on the top of it. See, some you know, that's why they call it a whipping when you get a whipping. Because if you whip cream, you know what I'm talking about. And you know, I love hot coffee in the morning. When I sit down and read all the dismal news, it brings some sobriety in my heart. And you know, I love golf. Listen, I'm giving you this for a reason. And I love watching golf. Other people would have to have a gun pointed at their head to make them watch golf. It's about like me, somebody have to go hold a gun to my head to make me watch hockey. Hockey. It don't even sound good, hockey. I know, we got a hockey fan over here. There's a point to this. Listen to me now. I love my church. Not the building. Not this organization. You are the church. Boy, I feel that so deep in my heart. I love the church. I love my family. My brothers, my sisters. Some of them more than others. (laughs) I love my wife. I love my God. The English language, once again, doesn't give much distinction in the word of love. And it can be used very ambiguously without much depth of meaning. 
I love coconut pie and I love God. It doesn't really give it justice. The Greek language is what God used to bring us forth the New Testament. And it helps us to define many words in the English language that doesn't really bring out the true meaning, which you're going to find out here in a little bit. I hope you have your notepads, something to write down on. If you don't, get the CD. Go back and listen to this again. It's very important. It's going to help you to understand love in a way perhaps you never have understood love before. So many times when love is given, it's not returned. Ask God. But the Greek language breaks down love in four major categories. One of them is eros. Eros is the root word for erotica. It's not used in the Bible. Eros was the Greek god of love, or more precisely, he was the god of passion and of physical desire. Many times when in the world especially, when the opposite sex meets one another, they find an attraction there that's based on eros. And many times that can get you into a, a lot of trouble. Because soon that attraction will fade based upon people's personalities or likes or dislikes. That's why young people have to be so very careful about their attraction to the opposite sex because they will be drawn to them for the wrong reasons. And it can be very destructive. And again, it is usually preoccupied, this heiress, completely with another and again, it comes from the root word of erotica. There's another word for love that many of you may not have never heard before in the Greek, but you'll understand what it is when I explain it. And the Greek is pronounced storgi. Storgi means familia. Some of you may know what familia is. That means family. Uh, refers to the natural or instinctual affection, such as the love of a parent, towards their children, or vice versa. That's that Greek word for that type of love, which is not used in the Bible. And again, the next one is philia. Many of you have, maybe students of the Word of God, understand this Greek word, philia. Philia is a friendship love. This occurs from bonding over similar interests. I've probably got people in this church that I could be very good friends with that love to cook. We have a lot of commonality there. And we have a love, if you will, for that particular interest. And that love brings about a friendship or philia among us. Uh, and again, you know, I've got sinners that play golf and we've got a friendship because we have this common interest. Outside of that, I irritate them. What I wanted to put in that text this morning when I wrote my friend in Bel Air was, did you feel the hand of God trying to wake you up? But you know, you've got to use wisdom. You don't want to alienate them. You know, those that are wise will win a soul. So again, this deals with common interest. There are those in love, and they are preoccupied with each other. But friends are both preoccupied with the same things, and of course, friends care about one another. But it is similar interest that attracts them to one another. When I first started playing golf, I went out, and I didn't realize I had a men's club. And uh, I joined the men's club at this golf course, and then all of a sudden, I had more friends than I knew what to do with because they had a common interest. But I found out they weren't my friends when there was a dispute over a score. <laughs> I've seen that ball move before you hit it and you touched it with your club. We have a common interest and we are friends to a certain extent. And that's that philia. In Romans 12, 
verse 9 and 10, it says this, Let love be without dissimulation. And I want to explain that word, dissimulation. And what he's talking about here is brotherly love. And he's talking to the body of Christ. Dissimulation means to love without hypocrisy or pretense, but be severe, sincere rather. He said, well, what exactly are you talking about? You can't be a friend of my face and chewing me up behind my back. You hear what I'm saying? And we've got to be very careful with that in the church. You can't tell me you love me to my face and treat me horrible behind my back. You've got to be careful about that. This is what Paul is bringing out here. Don't have any of this dissimulation in your relationship with a brother or sister in Christ. And it says, abhor, and that means to hate or detest that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And I hate the things that destroys people's lives. I hate it. And the world is full of it. And the church is guilty of a lot of times destroying people's lives. And... It says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. A lot of people read that and they think, well, I'm supposed to prefer him over myself. That is not what that Greek word means there, prefer. It means to lead by example. That's preferring one another. To lead by example. If you want to be a leader, you have to lead by example. You can't point the direction, you have to lead the direction. And if you're going to preach something, first of all, we on this platform have to eat it first. And we have to participate in that and use ourselves as an example. This is why I love preaching the message of the cross. Without the message of the cross and understanding in a Christian's life, you are doomed to defeat. And not only will you be defeated, but you're going to hurt people around you. Oh, you're supposed to be a Christian? One time we was going to do something, and I don't know, I was joking around. And uh, I made the statement, I said, well, come on over and we'll have a beer. Now see, if I said that to you as a Christian, your thoughts about me would change 180 degrees. I don't drink beer, I drink scotch. You see, I have to lead by example. That's what he's talking about, preferring one another. If I want you to have love for me, I'd better be sowing it in your life. And I don't mean by word alone. I mean the life that I live, it better be exemplary of who Christ is. That's why I love the message of the cross. I know that I know that I know that the Holy Spirit will work on the inside of you and He will form Christ in you over time. It does not happen overnight. But he begins to peel off the outside of this onion and leaves behind you a trail of a carnal life. And he will free you from those things and you'll never desire to go back and pick it up. You will abhor it. You will see it for what it is. And there's so many things on the inside of us that we don't even know is there. You know, we go to God and say, Lord, I want you to take this out of my life. And the Lord ignores you. Number one, it ain't your workmanship and you ain't the one scheduling the work. It is God Almighty that knows what needs to be dealt in you first. And as He begins to deal with it in an orderly fashion, things will be done according to His plan. And He will take care of these things. Let me tell you something else right here. This brotherly love... One of the reasons that we have brotherly love, that's filio. You know, one of the things that I have in common with a few of the brothers in the church is we love to go out and shoot lead down the, towards the target. Oh, we love to make loud noises and smoke and, 
gunfire. Oh, yeah. I had to go get an AR-10. That's not an AR-15. That's the little people's rifle. They'd give me a man's rifle. AR-10. And all my brothers were around watching and listening to the noise and watching this thing go off. Well, see, our friendship is based on this commonality. Now, I could invite them over to my house and tell them, listen, I want to show you how to make a pecan pie. I don't think they'd come. Now, there's a few ladies in the church making, oh, I want to see how you do this. See, there's a commonality that builds a friendship. But here's the commonality of the church, is our spirituality. We have a common interest, oh, hallelujah. We have a common interest in Jesus Christ. We have a common interest in the well-being of one another to be able to live a life that is exemplary of Jesus Christ. That's that, that's that filio. And that belongs in the church. But there's much more than that that belongs in the church that we have to go beyond this filio. Finally, the Greek word agape. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of liars in the church. Oh, I agape you. You liar. <laughs> Number one, they don't even know what agape is except for the word. And it sounds real Christian. sounds real spiritual. Oh, I'm just going to agape you. I don't even know what agape means. You, you confuse philia with agape. And God wants to mature us into a Life with true agape. Not just some manufactured replica of it, trying to produce it in our own self-effort. This is the highest form of love and has a much deeper meaning that escapes the casual observation of agape. This is a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's well-being and highest good for the other individual. Now, you might think that that's all fluff. You know, make sure you feel good about your life and all. It's much, much deeper than that. Agape is God doing what, listen to this very closely. Because see, we have Christ on the inside of us. God wants to be God on the inside of us. And He wants us to be ambassadors. You know, when an ambassador goes over into a foreign country, he represents the country that he's from. Agape is God doing what He knows is best for man and not necessarily what man desires. You hear me? God, if you love me, just get in the mirror and then just slap yourself. What do you mean, if you love me? He's already proven it by Christ dying on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. There's not a higher expression of God's love than that. And if He does nothing else for you, and your name's written in the book of life, you have been the recipient of the greatest love that can ever be expressed by God. Amen. John 3.16 shows God gave man what he needed, not what he wanted. You know, if man could get what he wanted, he'd want to live in sin and go to heaven. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to do what I want to do, what makes me feel good. <laughs> Agape love is unconcerned. These are important things for you to understand, people. Love is, listen, this agape love is unconcerned with self, but concerned with the greatest good of another. Agape isn't born just out of emotions, feelings, or familiarity, or attraction. 
One of the biggest problems we have as people is we have these invisible scales in our life. Oh yeah. He treated me like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now I'm going to treat him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're going to balance these scales out. You're going to do this to me, I'll do that to you. And I find myself like that at times. And the Lord corrects me very quickly. You've got the wrong attitude, dude all. You better straighten up. Because I'm going to tell you what, these things that you wish upon them may come back and arrest in your nest. Amen. Boy, this is going to get real heavy here in just a minute. This love comes from God. God's love, listen to this very carefully. This may kind of hit you kind of weird, but let it sink in. God's love isn't sentimental. Let it sink in. God's love is not sentimental. It means it is not swayed by emotions. Thank God it ain't. God's love is an outpouring from who He is. Oh, hallelujah. God is love. And when He pours out His love on us, it ain't based on anything but His will to pour it out on us. And that's why, you know, God even loves those that are determined to go to hell. And those that are there today, He still loves them. That hasn't changed. That's who He is but He will not condone their rejection of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who loves not, knows not God. He's talking about agape love. For God is love. You see, there's a great amount of maturity that has to take place in our lives. And people, it don't happen overnight. And it's going to take the Holy Spirit to be able to create it. No matter how you try to love people that are unlovable, Without the Holy Spirit producing it on the inside of you, it ain't going to happen. You can fake it. You can try to make it. You can, well, love is just a choice. <laughs> love is God. And He has to pour Himself in you and create who He is on the inside of you for you to love. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you ever run into somebody that's unlovable? That's because you don't know the true love that is God. There is nobody that is unlovable. You're going to say, well, you ain't met the people I know. <laughs> you don't know my family. And see, it's hard to persuade yourself to love them by your own efforts. Can't do it. I'm going to bake him a pie and I'm going to put a quart of some bad stuff in it. <laughs> amen, amen. Have you ever noticed this a messy proposition to be a Christian? Has anybody found out Christian life just real easy, just a breeze? Got the wind to your back, sun to your face. Never made a bogey. <laughs> Most of the time, we are continually have to get our bearings again to get back on course. Because it's easy for us. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. I want you to turn to John, chapter 21. John 21. When we're done with this today, you're going to say, man, I think I got a clue. I think I got an idea. I think I know what's going on. Why don't you turn to John again, 21, chapter 21, verse 15. This is such an important lesson, but if you're not careful, you're going to miss something here. You'll think you understand what it's saying, but you're going to miss it. He says, so when they had dined, this is when Jesus was resurrected. And he's seen him out there. And in the Greek, he said, hey boys, 
<laughs> hey boys, you hungry? They recognized that it was Christ. And if I remember correctly, I think Peter just jumped off the boat and came running over to him. And here's what's incredible. Jesus, this is how he can feed you. Had a fish dinner already. So if you want to ever get spiritual, go have fish and chips. <laughs> I know that's what Tom always has. I look at him and say, man, this is a spiritual man right there. Fish and chips. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Do you agape me? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I filio you. You see, there was a commonality there between Christ and Peter. And that was the God that had sent Christ and the God that Peter loved and wanted to serve. This new gospel that was being birthed through the death of Christ. He said unto him, feed, and this is very important, feed my lambs. You see, in the congregation there's lambs and there's sheep. The lambs are young in the Lord and the sheep have grown somewhat. And they both eat different things at different times. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And he said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I filio you. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. This is a point in case here. If you love the Lord, allow Him to use you to minister. And of course, this is part of the five-fold ministry here. But each and every one of us are ministers of reconciliation to bring that good news to those that are lost. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you feel you owe me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, do you love me? This also, when we look at it, it kind of reminds us that you know, Peter denied Christ three times. Christ never rebuked him for it. He merely asked him, and this may have been on Peter's mind, I don't know, that I had denied him three times, and now the Lord asked me three different times whether I love him. And the difficulty and the reason he's so grieved, how can you say you love me when you denied me? But then the, good, the Lord is reminding him that he has called him. All is forgiven. All is behind. But here's something else that will escape the casual reader. When Peter first met Jesus Christ, he called him and said, I want you to be fishers of men. But there's another story, another rendition of it, where Jesus came out and they were by the bank of the river or the lake, Galilee. And they had been fishing hadn't caught anything. And they were repairing their nets on the shore. And they were listening to Christ as the multitudes came. And there were so many that Jesus, He asked Peter, can I use your boat to move away from the shore a little bit so everybody isn't so crowded around me? Because if there's just a few right there, it prevents me from ministering to all of them. He says, yeah, go ahead and use the boat. And He cast out a little ways. And then he began to preach. And then when he got done, he told them, he said, get back in your boat and cast out into the deep. Take your nets out into the deep. And of course, Peter, there was some resistance there because he told him, hey, listen, I don't know whether you know it or not, but this is what I do for a living. So he was a little arrogant back then. He hadn't gone through many hoops. And he said, we do this for a living. There ain't no fish around here today. He says, go out. And after some resistance, he went back out. And when he went out there, he cast out in the deep. And there were so many fish, it was breaking their nets. And they came back. And what Jesus was showing here, these three times when He asked Peter, do you love me? He's telling Peter, I want you to cast out into the deep. I want you to understand my love that I have for you. 
that you could express that same love for others. And you will be a fisherman of many men. That's what God wants for us. Because if we can't bring to the world the true person of Jesus Christ, they won't listen to us. You know, you can't say you love me in one breath and then turn around and tear me down in another. The agape love is not full of fuzzy feelings. Listen to me. But it is part of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It is the Holy Spirit that develops this fruit of the Spirit. It can't be produced by self-effort. It is impossible. I want you to go over here to Matthew. I know this ain't no shouting message, but this is one that you can chew on. Matthew chapter 5. I want you to go to 5. I want you to go to verse 43. This is a deep one. But once I explain it, you're going to go, hey, no problem. He says here in verse 43, you have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. A lot of us are still practicing that. But he says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them who curse you. It's kind of hard when a lady's turning into the Dillon's parking lot and she gives me that flag of, in her hand, you know, bless those who curse you. When she did that, my natural instinct was, I can take her. <laughs> I think I can take her. And she's in the parking lot, and I just follow her over there. And then the Lord quickly said, get out of, get away from that. Bless them who curse you. Oh yeah, have a good day. Do good to them who hate you. Oh my. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What? That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. God is love. Do you hear me? God is love. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? They invited me over to the house for dinner, now I invite them over to my house for dinner, but that neighbor whose leaves keep blowing into my yard, he ain't coming to my house for dinner. <laughs> I really have a problem with them leaves, don't I? What reward have you? Not even, the, you know, <laughs> do not even the publicans the same? Sinners can do the same thing. You know, sinners can be best friends and blah, blah, blah. You do this and I'll do that. Now, let me explain this. This is the love God has for the lost. This is love your enemy. This is the love He has for the lost. It's easy to love your enemy. I don't think there's one single person you've ever met that you want them to spend eternity in a lake of fire. That's loving your enemy. You don't have to go out and chum around with them or try to get to be their friend. That's not what he said. He said, agape, your enemy. Love him for the salvation that I want to show him. And I'm going to tell you what, sinners can be some of the greatest enemies you ever come across. They snarl at you. They talk to you like you're dirt or whatever. You need to somehow ask the Holy Spirit to get inside that heart. Love your enemies. God loves them. Who are you to set yourself above God? This is that agape love. But let me tell you, it can't be produced by self-effort. God is doing it a transforming on the inside of us to teach us to be 
the children of the Father. We've got to be representatives of God. And I know it's no easy task. Because God has to overcome our flesh to deposit the things that He wants to put on the inside of us. And let me just retrace this just real quick. If your faith is not in Christ and what He did on Calvary, you will never reach that place that God wants you to be. Mm, 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 mm. You don't have to have an affection. You're not trying to be friends with them. You're trying to deliver their souls from a lake of fire for all eternity. The hatred of sin is always there. I will never compromise righteousness. But the love of salvation for the lost must be there. God used both expressions of love for Christ. Did you know that? He said, I love my son, agape, and I filio my son, because they had a commonality that they both were working towards saving man. Matter of fact, I don't know if I wrote it down or not, but he did. Uh, yeah, it's in John 5.20. For the father loves filio the Son, as found in John 5, 20, and shows Him all things that Himself does. And He will show Him greater works than these that you may marvel at the work that God does through Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 5, 26, and this is really kind of a, a revelation here. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And it says in 1 Peter 5.14, Greet you one another with a kiss of charity or love. Peace be with you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. You men, don't you become kissing me on the cheek. We're going to get a funky relationship if you do. What is taking the place of that is a handshake. An embrace. That's what it is. But back then it was the custom. Give, kiss them on the cheek to let them know that you were their friend. You were their brother, if you will. You had a commonality there. And, but here's the startling thing. In Luke 22:48, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, You betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? You know, this relationship that we were supposed to have one another. You have betrayed me. And you have delivered me over to these men. Let me tell you a little story here real quick. And I'm going to let you out of here. Not as early as I did. Last. I, I thought it was 12 o'clock last week or you'd have never got out of here. <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> I apologize and ask for your forgiveness. Let me tell you a little story about a corn farmer. You know, when I was younger... I kind of viewed myself as a farmer. <laughs> I grew out of that pretty quick. But in, in the backyard, when I was in Mississippi going to college out there, I was living with my in-laws, and I decided, I said, listen, I want to make a little garden out here. And I had a lot of energy back then, not much brains, but I had a lot of energy. And uh, I've got a little area about this wide, and probably to the drum set there, and I dug it all up, got the dirt looking real good, put fertilizer in it. Man, I put radishes down here. I put some carrots down here. And then I put a row of corn here. And then I put some other stuff over here. And all my stuff came up. My corn kind of didn't do anything. I thought, well, what in the world's wrong with my corn? You know, I did everything it told me to do. What I didn't understand, corn has to be in rolls besides each other so they can pollinate. If it don't, you ain't going to get no corn. You're going to get corn stalks, but you ain't going to get no corn. And I didn't realize that. But there was a farmer who over the years had created a hybrid corn. And it was very resistant to insects. It was very resistant to drought. And it made some of the best corn. He got the best prices on the market because of the way they graded it. And all the farmers around him knew that he was growing some of the best corn out there. And 
after several years, this farmer goes around to all the farmers around him that are growing corn, and he says, listen, I want to give you some seed stock, corn. And he said, why in the world would you give us this corn? You're our competitor and you get a much better price. He said, one of the reasons that I want you to grow all this corn is when it grows up, guess what? The best corn that's growing is going to pollinate my corn. And we're all going to benefit from it. Here's my point. You allow the Holy Spirit to mature this agape love in you. I'm going to tell you what, you're going to spread this to other people. And when that agape, oh hallelujah, when that agape love grows up in them, guess what? It's going to return back to you. And everybody's going to be able to benefit by this love that is in this church. I don't know how many times I've heard people come in here and say, man, I can just sense the love. And I'm going to tell you what, we need to renew ourselves in that again. We've got to have a love for one another. We've got to pray. And ask, God, I'm asking, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to develop in me a love that goes beyond emotions, that goes beyond affections, goes beyond filio, goes beyond having a common thread that binds us together. I want to go beyond that because it's immature just to have a filio, friendship, love. We're supposed to have that, but we got to go beyond that. And the Holy Spirit will bring it in. And you'll begin to demonstrate it in your life. And you'll begin to love people like you've never loved before. And I'm going to tell you something. I told my wife this morning. We've gone through some hard times. But when I gave my life back to the Lord in 04, and I began to understand this message of the cross and became rooted in it, the Lord put an agape love in my heart for this woman like I have never known before. And I, you know, I understand it. Because I'm going to tell you what, she may or may not believe it or not, but I'd lay my life down for her. I'd take a bullet for her. I would not allow anybody to hurt her, and I mean even her feelings. Uh, you know, I'll go to a certain level, but I mean I would lay my life down for her. Let me tell you, that's what Christ did for the church. And that's what each one of us be willing to do for one another, is to lay our lives down for each other. And not prefer ourselves, to, but to be an example of this love. And again, you know, you've heard the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bounds, but words will never hurt me. And that was said by one of the stupidest people in the world. Because the Word of God says there is life and death in the tongue. You better know it. You know, you may not realize it. And I'm talking about just going to somebody you don't even know. And I know Brother Dan has done it. I've heard the testimonies. You know, Deb and I, you know, you're always seeing somebody out with a cardboard sign that says, hey, blah, blah, blah. I thought about getting me one. Puts on there, underpaid pastor, help. <laughs> Give a man a buck. Come on, man. <laughs> Help a brother out. <laughs> but every once in a while, Deb and I'll go by and the Holy Spirit will move upon me when somebody's got one of those. And I'll help them. And I'll let them know that, hey, we love you because of Christ that lives on the inside of us. And I want you to know where this comes from. You have no idea. That word is a seed and is planted in their hearts. And it can do more than you will ever possibly know. Because there is life and there is death. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that caused more death than anything else to find out somebody that pretends to be your friend and you found out that they said some horrible things about you. They gossiped about you. And that is power to destroy people's lives. To destroy your relationship with them. Because I'm going to tell you, once a word is spoken, it can't be taken back. It's out there. And that's why we have to be careful. That's why He said, be slow to speak. And I'm learning that around the house. <laughs> I think Dave sent me something where a man and a woman were trying to find a parking spot. And the woman was yelling at him. 
would you find a parking spot? He says, I'm trying to find a parking spot. He says, why are you getting so angry just to get a parking spot? When I am by myself, I never get angry when I'm trying to find a parking spot. <laughs> just little things can create horrible results because of a word that is spoken. And again, <laughs> love is not about trying to make you feel better either. Uh-oh, agape love. You know, you thought agape love, man, I'm just going to bring you good stuff, put it on your porch, and going to talk nice to you and tell you how great you are all the time. <laughs> oh, that pastor, he's got a lot of agape love. No, that's a bunch of political love. I'll tell you junk you want to hear. No. Forgiveness is such a big part of agape love. When you walk around with unforgiveness, it's like eating rat poison and expect the rat to die. Let me let that sink in. Walking around with unforgiveness in your life is like eating rat poison and, and dread thinking the rat's going to die. It will kill you. It'll make you sick, keep you from sleeping at night. They'll be in your brain all the time. Right in my life. Oh, yeah. I know y'all ain't been there before. We can see this very plainly about forgiveness in John 3.16. God says, I want to forgive you if you will allow me. I want to forgive you. And when we go to people and let them know oh, you love them irrespective of what they've said or what they've done. And I mean mean it. It's not just words. It comes from your heart. You see in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60, we see a perfect picture of this. And it says, And they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God, and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The Lord took him home. In Matthew chapter 18, it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him seven times? You know, Peter didn't know what he was really saying there. He was trying to establish a rule that he himself would be destroyed by. He was trying to create a ledger. That's one. <laughs> That's two. Three, four, five, six, seven. You're out of here. But I love what the Lord said. And this is what will come through agape love. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto you seven times, but until seventy times seventy. Let me tell you, your flesh ain't going to forgive nobody. 490 times. Four, and you're out of here in my book. Maybe three. It depends on your attitude. <laughs> Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. I'm about to let you all out of here. Matthew chapter 18. I want you to turn to verse 23. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which take account of his servants? This is right after Peter asked that question about seven times, or verses 70 times seven. And the Lord gives him an example here. This is such a great parable here. And when he had begun to reckon, in other words, take an account, look at the books to see who owed him money, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That's hundreds of millions of dollars. Before as much as he couldn't pay, 
his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children, and that all that he had payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one fellow servant which owed him a hundred pence. That was about $300. This is a very important lesson the Lord is showing us. But the same servant went out and found the one that owed him the uh, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him saying, have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired it of me. Should not you also have compassion on your fellow servant, even if I have had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one of his brothers of their trespasses. That's why the Lord, when he gave the Lord's prayer, he told them at the end, you better forgive those that have a trespass against you. Because if you don't, you're setting yourself above the Father. You are making yourself more righteous than the one that forgave you. And you become wicked. And he said, I won't forgive you. That's why it's so important this agape love be matured on the inside of us because forgiveness comes just like that. Don't give it a thought. It's fine. I've had people that have done things to me. I said, don't worry about it. It's all right. But I blah, blah, blah. still want to keep breaking. I said, listen, forget about it. It's not important. What's more important is you. That's what's important. Not the issue. We'll grow through this. It'll be fine. I got people that, in my own family that owes me money. And I'm going to turn them over to the collection bureau. <laughs> not true. You know what? The Lord said if you lend, don't expect it back. Just give it to them. It's a gift. They needed it, and I'm giving it to you. And it's fine. And there's one last thing here. <laughs> In John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit operating in you. Amen. To think that we can love one another as Christ loved us? That is... That is a depth of maturity that few ever reach. It's to truly love one another even as Christ loved you. Do you know that every time I go to Christ when I mess up, He never throws it in my face? He never says how rotten I am. You should have never done this. You know what He says? I forgive you. I make you whole. Amen. And you know every time you forgive somebody, you make that relationship whole once again. And that's why love is so extremely important in our relationship with one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. That's one of the hallmarks, is that we love one another even as Christ loved us. If you have love one to another, and finally in John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And finally, I'm going to close with this. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 10 and 11. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive it for your sakes, forgive I it in the person of Christ. What he's saying there, what I'm doing is not on my own accord. 
It's the Christ that lives on the inside of me that gives me a heart to really want to forgive and forget about it. You know, if you bring up past conflict that you've had with people, I remember what you did back then. You have not forgiven them. That thing should be out of your mind and never be brought up again. How would you like it if every time you turn around, the Lord wakes you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and says, listen, you little scumbag, I want to talk to you. <laughs> you remember what you did back in 84? No? Well, let me remind you. <laughs> least Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices unforgiveness will rot the soul it will people it will rot I want you to stand to your feet this morning people I know this is not a shouting message but I'm going to tell you it's one you chew on and understand what love is. There is a filial love. And that's a good love. That we have a commonality, especially in the body of Christ. But we have an agape love. And I'm going to tell you, when God loves us, He will do things in our lives that doesn't feel like love. Listen to that now. He will do anything to get you to heaven. And He may have to take you down a path that's very uncomfortable. But He does it because He loves you. He doesn't allow it to happen because He doesn't love you or He deserts you, but He will always be there. So understand, agape love isn't about making you feel good all the time. Agape love is like a parent that takes care of their children. And that's what God is doing in our lives. Heavenly Father, once again, we're so grateful, Father, for Your love. And we pray, Lord, as Your children. I pray for the Holy Spirit to work and operate in us. And help us to give each other room to grow, Lord. There's so much growth that must be taking place in our lives. And Lord, we need to be loved by each other. We need to be understood that we're still fragile, carnal human beings that make mistakes. And I, oh, hallelujah. Lord, I feel that. I pray for love to sweep over this congregation to help us to be representatives of Christ as we should be, Father. And I pray once again, Lord, that you strengthen your people. And I pray you bring them back at the appointed time. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Love one another. Amen.